if, if you're like me, you've noticed uh, perhaps on cars driving around uh, this coexist bumper sticker. Uh, and this bumper sticker uh, is, uh, I think, a, a crystallization of the notion that there's something about religion oftentimes uh, that inherently leads us not to coexist with one another. Uh, right? So the way that it's framed, um, although we'll come back to these, uh, the, the origin goes back actually to the cultural icons U2. If U2 does it and says it, it must be... It must be cool. It must be legitimate. Um, now, from their context uh, in Ireland and in Northern Ireland and their, their own history, um, I think this plays into why this would be uh, an important theme for them. But originally, this started out as a way, uh, as a symbol you see here, uh, with references to Christianity, to Judaism, to Islam, um, and thinking about uh, the need uh, for coexistence uh, among those different factions. You can see, you know, Bono has this. Uh, as a headband. Uh, and so there's this, this is, I think, um, the pop culture representation uh, of a deeper assumption that is very much woven into uh, how we think and operate when it comes to religion. That there is something about religion that inherently makes us not want to coexist uh, with one another. Uh, and so when we look at this, this is something that you see, not just in Bono and not just on bumper stickers, uh, but there are a number of books, and these are just a few samples, uh, that highlight the connection between uh, religion and violence, uh, religion and evil. Uh, so Charles Kimball, uh, When Religion Becomes Evil, um, an edited volume from a number of years back, Must Christianity Be Violent? Again, part of the assumption is it, it sort of inherently is, but maybe there's some way we can, we can free it from that. Uh, Martin Marty talks uh, quite, uh, quite a bit about this in his book, Politics, Religion, and the Common Good, uh, Richard Wentz. Uh, and then a couple of these, interesting that both, you, know, you have the Oxford Handbook of Religion and Violence and the Blackwell Companion to Religion and Violence. Now again, part of the thing to note here is there is not, for example, uh, a Blackwell Companion to secularism and violence, or to nationalism and violence, or to racism and violence. There's something about religion that is inherently connected to violence, some, something uh, going on there. Um, it's, I think it's, it's not an accident that there has been an explosion both in the scholarly and in the popular world um, of this type of thinking uh, after 9-11. Uh, and so as, as we think about both Osama bin Laden and President George W. Bush, what's interesting uh, is that Oftentimes the critique is leveled that there's something flawed about the religion of both of these figures. Uh, that if we want to get to the root or the heart of understanding Osama bin Laden, we have to understand, first and foremost, his religion. Uh, likewise, many critiques of President Bush in the wake of Afghanistan and Iraq focused on uh, Bush's conservative evangelical faith. Something is going on there in terms of his religion uh, that makes him inherently susceptible to, uh, to waging wars, to dropping bombs. Um, PBS Frontline did a special on George W. Bush called The Jesus Factor. Again, not the American factor, not the, what, it's the Jesus Factor. Something's going on here uh, in the religion of the president uh, that, that produces this. And so, again, why do we focus on, why do we latch on to religion? Um, as being the peculiar cause here. A couple of ways that the myth of religious violence gets summarized, uh, one from Charles Kimball. He says, more wars have been waged, more people killed, and more evil perpetrated in the name of religion than by any other institutional force uh, in human history. This is largely uh, a negative take. Uh, you get Leroy Rauner um, giving a little bit, I don't know if this is fair and balanced or not, um, but religion has probably been the single most significant cause of warfare in human history, and at the same time, uh, the single most significant force for peace. So this is trying to say, well, it does a lot of bad things, it does a lot of good things. But it shares the assumption um, that religion is this force, it's there, it's identifiable, um, and it's separable. Uh, in his book, The Myth of Religious Violence, um, William Kavanaugh uh, summarizes this myth. Uh, and a large part of what I'm doing today uh, is just summarizing and trying to give a few suggestions um, or, or examples of how this functions. 
uh, from Kavanaugh himself. Uh, this isn't my own original thinking. It would be nice if it was, um, but I'm, I'm just reporting here. This is how Kavanaugh states the myth. He says, the myth is the idea that religion is a trans-historical and trans-cultural feature of human life. And so no matter where we go across time, no matter where we go across, around the globe, um, there is always going to be this element that we can identify uh, going under the name of religion. So anytime I engage a culture or, or think about a different culture or time, um, this is always something there. It's also something that is distinct and separable from secular features, uh, things such as politics or economics or art. Uh, uh, and so from my own tradition, uh, which is a, a reformed kind of Kuyperian neo-Calvinism, Abraham Kuyper himself uh, has this way of thinking about different spheres in society that says there's this sphere of religion or faith, which is separable and distinct from these other spheres like economics or art uh, or the state. Um, and so that, that's the idea here. It's distinct from these other features and it has the peculiar inclination to promote violence. There, there's something about this feature that if left unchecked is always going to uh, cause people uh, to react in violence against one another. Hence the need to encourage people to coexist because they inherently want to not, not to coexist because of this violence um, uh, that's inherent to religion. And so religion needs to be tamed and limited because of this problem. Uh, and Kavanaugh surveys uh, a number of different scholars who talk about the issues with religion. Why is religion a problem? And he categorizes them um, into uh, three different critiques. That religion is absolutist, uh, right, because in many ways it appeals to something like divine authority. Uh, this is absolute. There's no, there's no wiggle room back or forth. And so it makes these absolute claims. Because it makes absolute claims, especially if you get competing religions then, it's seen as inherently divisive. Uh, some people are affirming some things while other are not. Uh, and so religion causes, uh, uh, inherently splits within the human community, and it's insufficiently rational. Uh, religion, again, uh, this, this trades on a, a dichotomy between faith and reason. Uh, that reason uh, is something set apart from and over against religious authority or any kind of uh, written authority, uh, any kind of holy scriptures. And so uh, religion has to be uh, put in its place. Now, luckily, there's just such an entity to do that, uh, and that is the secular nation state. Uh, and so if religion is this universal factor uh, and this universal problem that causes violence, then the universal solution to that uh, is the modern liberal state. And it appears then, once religion is cast in this way, the secular nation state is not just a historically contingent um, reality, but it becomes uh, the answer in all times and places to the inherent dangers of religion. Uh, and so the, the way that um, different scholars look at this is that religion gets invented at the same time as the modern nation state. Uh, they are essentially fraternal twins. Uh, this is how uh, these function. Now the function of the myth uh, is to legitimate and delegitimate certain kinds of violence. So you can look at an image of different buildings being blown up, and part of the way that we are going to categorize whether it is an illegitimate terrorist attack or a legitimate uh, attack by a nation state uh, comes because of how this myth functions. One is religiously motivated. Uh, as such, it's irrational. It inherently leads to violence. The other is uh, the rational violence of the state whose goal is peacemaking. Um, and so this myth of religion serves to say um, not that all violence is bad or that all violence is good, but it says some kinds of violence are inherently problematic. Other types of violence are necessary and even good uh, because they are going to produce uh, unity and peace. Now, Kavanaugh highlights several qualities of the myth. Um, part of the, the way that this, uh, the way that myths work is that myth and reality mutually reinforce. So if you think about the myth, for example, uh, of racial superiority or the myth of sexism, um, if that is perpetuated as a myth, that is going to change how you treat people on the ground. And that if, for example, you say that certain people are not able to be educated, you're not going to educate them, which means that they are in fact less educated and the myth and reality become mutually reinforcing and they perpetuate. In a similar way, I think one interesting thing to ask is, 
um, how and why do we see certain images relating to certain types of violence, even consider mass shootings or the Boston bombing. Um, with some types of violence, you see police response, you see first responder response, other times you see SWAT teams, very rarely do you see a whole city shut down and tanks on the street. Part of what that says is there's a kind of violence here uh, that is so irrational, so dangerous, uh, that we have to completely close the city down as opposed to there's somebody on the loose who is shooting people with, a, with an assault rifle. Um, or even think back, I had to look online, it was a little fuzzy in my memory, uh, of uh, David Koresh and Waco in the Branch Davidian compound. Um, you have tanks there, why? Because this is a religious nut. And to deal with religious nuts, you're going to need some heavy artillery. Um, and so, so the myth and reality mutually reinforce. Uh, one of the, the, the interesting things about myths is that they elude our normal processes of verification and refutation. They're the lens through which we see everything, uh, and as such, it becomes very difficult even to think about uh, how these things function. And so to some extent, uh, when I talk about religion, it should always be in scare quotes here, because part of what Kavanaugh is trying to do is say, uh, we need to unpack and deconstruct uh, the very way that this shapes how we look at the world around us. Um, and myths often hide particular configurations of power. Uh, if there is no ground uh, for how this functions, myths become uh, how and why we believe what we believe and why we do what we do. And so there are, in some sense, there is no good reason. There's nothing beyond the myth. The myth is the foundational reality. Even to think about you know, how we look at Genesis 1 and 2 uh, from a Christian angle as providing uh, this foundational myth, there's nothing, you don't dig deeper than that. That is telling you this is the way the world is. Um, this is who we are. This is who God is. And so when we think about how this myth functions, um, it's the same kind of way. There, there's nothing beyond that. Um, so to undo the myth, I think uh, that part of our challenge is simply to recognize uh, that this is a myth, that it is in play, uh, that I think for people of all uh, faith traditions, it's important uh, to confess our complicity in this, to be aware of the fact uh, that oftentimes uh, we further this in a couple of ways. Um, sometimes it is through our violence. So the idea here is not to say religious people are never violent, but rather to say what causes people to be violent. There are a whole host of things, so the more that we can identify that, uh, the better off we'll be. So we are complicit um, in and through our own violence, but we're also complicit sometimes in the way that we perpetuate this. So it is not just, you, know, you have very vocal people like new, the New Atheists emphasizing religion is evil, religion is violent. Um, you even have many Christians who are perpetuating the same myth, um, that there's something about religion in general or specific faith traditions uh, that do this. And sometimes we use this in religious polemics or apologetics against other faith traditions. Uh, so there's something about this tradition that just makes it inherently susceptible uh, to violence. So we have to be, I think, careful in, in terms of how we use this. Now, part of Kavanaugh's critique, he says there's basically this problem of definition and distinction. What counts as religion and what doesn't? How do you define what is a religion and what isn't? And his problem here uh, is not that people are too fuzzy on the definition, but that oftentimes we're actually unjustifiably clear about why one thing counts as religion and one thing does not. And so he points to the problem even within the religious studies field um, of being able to identify or say uh, that you know, uh, um, we're going to say that, that Buddhism is a religion, uh, even though there's no, uh, typically understood to be no God in the way that uh, a Christian would say that there is. Uh, well, Marxism doesn't believe in God either. So is that, why does Buddhism qualify as a religion, but Marxism doesn't? Um, people are willing to kill in the name of their religion. They're also willing to kill in the name of their nation. Why does one qualify uh, as a religion and, and one does not? Um, and it's interesting to see how this even shapes the evolution uh, of the coexist slogan. So you have this beginning, the humble beginnings with you two. Um, and then you have this developed a bit. Uh, and there are symbols uh, connected. Not, the one that mystifies me a little bit here, maybe not, is the E. To what extent... I mean, is, 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 are we saying gender studies is on the same par as religious studies, that my identity, it's not really clear exactly why that factors in. Um, 
there are even other examples. You know, Richard Dawkins would probably like to punch whoever made this. Um, <laughs> that put science in there. So now science is a religion as well, or it's somehow rooted in some kind of ultimate faith, uh, as well as I think the saying, how do you say, what, what is it in paganism uh, and uh, Wiccanism or Christianity and Judaism, what do all these things share? And, and part of Kavanaugh's point is that when you really try to figure out what they share, it gets very difficult um, to say, yes, this is the common thread that unites them all. Uh, and so Charles Kimball includes, for example, a whole variety of things uh, you see here. I'm not going to list all those. Um, but Timothy Fitzgerald also highlights the fact that other, in different religious studies texts, things like totems, witchcraft, the rights of man, Marxism, liberalism, Japanese tea ceremonies, nationalism, sports. Right? Anybody want to tell me the NFL is not uh, the civil religion of, of our country? I'm seeing this pop up in my Facebook feed already, this sort of quasi-Christian overtones every Friday, wait for Sunday, Sunday's coming, Sunday's going to be here, right? This time when you can gather together with the sacred, you know, the, the mystical communion of fellow Lions fans to mourn um, whatever is bad is about to happen, um, right? Which is, so sometimes suffering does unite communities and, and Lions fans are, are testimony to that. Um, and so part of Fitzgerald's point here, again, is to say, once you start looking at different things that get included, how do you distinguish religion from culture in general? How do you draw these lines uh, and then say, well, religion is inherently this, this, this problematic thing that, that causes, uh, causes violence? And so Kavanaugh lists three different views of religion. Um, and first, he says, this is the view that he critiques most heavily. The essentialist view of religion is, is this myth. And he says... There's a problem here that it's anachronistic, uh, right? It is taking uh, a modern construct and using that to look uh, not only at other cultures today, but even at past cultures, uh, and saying this is this insufficiently recognizes the way that this is a product of Western, uh, especially Western history. And it's not just anachronistic, but it includes power functions. It, it makes us blind to the way that this serves certain people in power uh, and others who are not in power. And so he says the very claim that the boundaries between religion and non-religion are natural, eternal, fixed, and immutable is itself a part of a new configuration of power that comes about with the rise of the modern state. So to even say religion and politics should be separated, that is itself a political claim. Um, but oftentimes we don't recognize it as such. Uh, this is just normal. This is just expressing uh, reality. And so the modern liberal state then functions uh, by saying, look, uh, the individual, uh, when we think about how indiv religion operates, the individual has the right to make their own choices here. There's no substantive collective ends. Uh, the, the state just serves to protect each individual pursuing their own ends. Unless, of course, those ends should conflict with, with the state. And so part of what gets missed here is that the state becomes this absolute end in itself that can brook no competitors. So if you have, for example, in, in American history, um, if you have indigenous people who happen to resist uh, the claims of the state, um, those people are not tolerated, all right? You, you cannot, and so there's, in the Christian tradition at least, if something claims to be an end in itself, that's a function that actually only God has. Uh, and so this, this idea that religion is inherently um, this private individual thing uh, feeds into the state functioning in a, in a way that's very godlike. A functionalist view, uh, I think uh, Kavanaugh is much more amenable to this. Uh, this is basically the looks like a duck test. If it, if it quacks like a duck, walks like a duck, it's a duck. Uh, and so one way then to test what somebody really treats as ultimate is to look at what they do rather than to what they say or how they might, might talk. And so one way that Kavanaugh talks about this is in terms of sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice for? Um, and so when we think about uh, the sacrifice or the near sacrifice of Isaac, uh, Abraham is saying, you know, I put my absolute faith and trust in God because of my willingness to sacrifice Isaac. Likewise, what we're willing to sacrifice our sons and daughters for says something about what we really treat as ultimate. Um, and so if, if this is how the modern state is functioning, uh, then then it is what it is. Call it what it is. If it's, if it's just walking like a duck, quacking like a duck, call it a duck. Kavanaugh, though, says, go, goes deeper than this and says, from a constructivist view, 
the question is not simply trying to say what's the universal nature of religion or, or how does everybody function in this way, but specifically to ask in our time and place, uh, how is this construct used and what purpose does it serve? So, for example, why would somebody deny that nationalism is a religion? And I deal with this in my uh, class with, with um, juniors and seniors. If I make the claim that nationalism is a religion or something like that, there are typically a few who quite vehemently push back against that. No, it's not. It's not a religion. Well, wh why is it not? What's, what's going on there? What purpose is being served? Or similarly, why is violence on behalf of the Muslim Ummah religious? Uh, think about the, the, the community there. Um, but violence on behalf of the American nation state secular. Why does one qualify as justifiable and secular and the other qualifies as, as religious? Uh, and so this, this is where part of Kavanaugh's critique, again, is that this ultimately provides the foundational legitimation for the nation state. And here he does see some use in the functional definition um, going back and saying, look at how people actually operate. What gets the ultimate priority? How do people actually act in their lives? And that's going to tell you something uh, about what really is or isn't functioning uh, as God. So very briefly, I'm just going to highlight the genealogy of the myth. Um, he points out that in Christian history, religio serves, uh, or is a reference to an obligation to perform some action. It is not religion set over against economics or, or secular or something of that nature, but it is a way to speak pretty universally, uh, even in the Roman, uh, the Greco-Roman context, about what are your obligations as citizen, what are your obligations you know, to God or the gods, to your fellow human being, to the state, to your... How do all these things function? Uh, religio uh, has this binding effect of fulfilling the obligations that are there. And so both for, Aquinas, or for Augustine and Aquinas, um, there's a sharp contrast when they see this as a, as a virtue um, and as something that's much more specifically focused on these kind of obligations we have as opposed to some broad sphere set over against something else. Uh, John Locke, of course, is going to be our villain. Um, in terms of the way he sets up this dichotomy between uh, religion, which is all the things on the left-hand side here. Religion has to do with the interior, with the individual, with the private. There's no place for violence here, uh, right? In part because, you know, why would you be violent about something that's just some kind of personal conviction that you may or may not you know, be able to prove or, or share with the broader community? Um, and obedience is voluntary. Uh, the state then um, takes on to itself these things, outward force, it's corporate or communal, it's public. There's a monopoly on violence and obedience is not in fact voluntary. Uh, and so anything having to do with the use of outward goods has to do with the state. Uh, the state has the purview there. And part of what Kavanaugh points out is that this would have been completely foreign, for example, to medieval Christianity to say that what I do, uh, how I function with my body and the use of outward goods is, a, is something having to do with the state. Um, how would that translate to monks, for example, where everything has to do with how you are engaging and how are you, you, you're using the outward goods? Um, and, and so Locke uh, sets up this dichotomy. Now this is where I think it, it, it's interesting uh, to look at a, a couple examples of how this rhetoric comes through in our context. Uh, duty, note maybe you probably can't read the really small print on your handout. Fulfill your obligations. Right? So it's interesting to see there the connection between how religio gets defined. Uh, really, religio is this is your duty. Uh, and there's an there's an interesting quote here from General George Patton. I am a soldier. I fight where I'm told and I win where I fight. Now think about even in terms of you know, the definition of uh, current authors who say religion is absolute, uh, religion is divisive, I mean holding a gun is fairly divisive typically, um, uh, uh, and that it's insufficiently rational, right? I fight where I'm told. I mean there's an example of absolute authority. There's no, there's no room or space for for critical examination or to stop and think about this. Uh, and so what's interesting to me is, what, what if you shifted this? What if you had a picture of a medieval crusader on here with the same slogans and the same quote? How would we perceive that? Right? What if you had a picture on here calling for jihad, do your duty, fulfill your obligations? Right? And so the way that we read this 
is filtered through the myth of religious violence. There's nothing problematic here. This is just normal. You know, you're, you're doing your duty. Um, other examples, similar slogan, duty, uh, fulfill your obligation. People sleep peaceably in their beds at night because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. From George Orwell, anybody having flashbacks to a few good men? Um, uh, the great lines from Jack Nicholson. Uh, and the way that this gets, right, this is very much part of the gaming culture as well, call of duty. This is a call to your obligation, your, your religious, uh, your religio. Uh, now inherent to this myth is the idea that at some point in history there was this thing called the wars of religion or, or multiple wars. Uh, and this is why the modern state ends up coming on the scene because nations are, or because peoples are fighting primarily over religious issues. And so if we're going to verify something like the wars of religions, we would have to assume that combatants opposed each other based on religious difference, that the primary cause was religion, uh, not these other things, otherwise, why call them wars of religion, um, that religious causes then are analytically separable from political, economic, and social causes, uh, and the rise of the state then served as a solution to these wars. Uh, now, I don't have time here to detail this. I would recommend Kavanaugh's book, but Kavanaugh walks through page after page uh, of the actual history. Uh, my eyes were starting to gloss over as I was having flashbacks to uh, my history class, which shows I probably should have paid better attention because then I could have written the book instead of Kavanaugh. Um, <laughs> but part of what he points out is that the historical record shows Catholics versus Catholics, Protestants versus Protestants, and Protestant and Catholic collaboration um, in all of the various wars that are called wars of religion. Well, if that's the case, why are they called wars of religion? Often what you see uh, is uh, certain monarchs trying to, uh, certain members of the nobility trying to get a greater hold on power, uh, others, lesser magistrates, trying to resist that. And so oftentimes you have, you know, allegedly Roman Catholic monarchs fight, even fighting the Pope uh, and other things back and forth. Uh, the one thing, interesting thing he points out is that you actually never have Calvinists fighting Lutherans, <laughs> for whatever that's worth. I don't know what that means, but there's, uh, there, there's no record of that. But if this is true, why call it wars, why call them the wars of religion? There, there are wars about something, there's violence happening, and certainly uh, these are folks who profess themselves to be members of various Protestant and Roman Catholic churches, but if you can't uh, think about religion in this way, then why call them this? Uh, he says, well, in part because this is an anachronistic account of religion and setting this over against these other factors like politics uh, and economics. He even argues uh, that the rise of the state is the partial cause of the so-called wars of religion, that it's part of the consolidation process uh, on the part of some that produces uh, a lot of the strife that you see. So uh, again, this flips sort of the standard historical tale on its head uh, by arguing that the, the state here is part of the cause. So how does this function? I think this is, for me, is, is, is uh, the payoff to recognize that this myth continually reinforces the reality and necessity of the state. There's constantly this chaos that, that threatens to break loose, and so the state is needed to impose uniformity, to make sure that people actually do uh, coexist. And so you get a perpetual construction of the religious secular binary. Uh, and this is woven, Kavanaugh shows how this uh, works its way, uh, especially in 20th century Supreme Court decisions, uh, where you actually get justices referencing the fact that, you know, if we don't have uniformity, violence is going to break loose. And he points out the irony that that really wasn't a threat at all, but it's a key part of the rhetoric uh, that this is why you need a for uniformity across the board. Um, and so uh, you have uh, the continual production of uh, what is counted as religion or what is not. Uh, this is not just a universal timeless category that's there, but it's part of how our cultural meaning making always works. Uh, this also produces a lack of critical analysis by faith traditions on use of violence. So we basically ceded the fact that yes, the state does have this monopoly on violence uh, and we're willing to serve the state in, in the execution of that uh, because this is rational. It's for the purposes of keeping the peace. Uh, and ultimately, Kavanaugh gets quite pointed here. He says this justifies the liberal wars of liberation, the West versus the rest. And so uh, modern Western liberalism is inherently superior to cultures who are not as differentiated as we are. Right? They haven't learned like we have to set religion aside. They haven't learned like we have to bracket those things in the public square 
And therefore, the best thing to do is actually to bring that kind of freedom and democracy to cultures that lack that. Uh, and so, I mean, the logic here uh, is, as he says, it's impeccable. Religious violence is inherently irrational. And so what we need to do uh, is to bring our rational violence to bear on them so that they will then understand how irrational they are. Right? We would reason with them, but because we know already in advance that they're so religious that reason has no role, um, you're going to have to bomb people into democracy. Uh, and also, it, conveniently, you don't need history so much. Uh, and so even as we think about um, how we tell certain stories or how we think about international politics, uh, if you've seen the movie Argo, uh, that movie uh, tells, tells a tale of the, the Iranian hostages, that starts out by giving the backstory uh, on the U.S. involvement uh, in Iran in 1953 and overthrowing the government there, um, and does, I think, a fairly decent job of that, so that you're aware that it's not just there are crazy religious people over there who hate us because of our freedom. But actually, international politics might have a good deal to do with why people don't like us. Uh, and so, again, once you have this myth, though, and I'm thinking about Osama bin Laden, I'm not thinking about the Cold War and nationalism and how the geopolitics in the Middle East affected that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not thinking about what we call uh, this kind of fundamentalism as an inherently modern phenomenon, right? Modern fun fundamentalism is not a leftover from the Middle Ages. It's a production of uh, the rise of nationalism um, the nation states. So Sam Harris says, this is his, his summary. I probably already stole his thunder. Some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill people for believing them. Right? That's your rational atheist talking. Um, this may seem an extraordinary claim, but it merely enunciates an ordinary fact about the world in which we live. Certain beliefs place their adherents beyond the reach of every peaceful means of persuasion while inspiring them to commit acts of extraordinary violence against others. There is, in fact, no talking to some people. If they can't be, sounds kind of like what's going on in the U.S. Uh, <laughs> what's going on in Washington right now? Um, otherwise, tolerant people may be justified in killing them in self-defense. This is what the U.S. attempted in Afghanistan, and it's what we and other Western powers are bound to attempt at an even greater cost to ourselves and innocents abroad elsewhere in the Muslim world. We will continue to spill blood in what is at bottom a war of ideas. Is that more or less rational than people of religious faith and how people of religious faith approach this? And Harris actually goes on to say, we might have to do a nuclear first strike, but ultimately it'll be their fault because they're so unreasonable. Right? And so again, the logic here is it's perfectly circular. Uh, one other thing, and then, and then I'll cl close. Uh, one of my favorite um, whipping boys in the past, uh, President George W. Bush received quite a bit of flack. Um, these, are, these are various quotes from, from his speeches. Uh, Freedom and fear, justice and cruelty have always been at war. We know that God is not neutral between them. Ours is the cause of human dignity. Freedom guided by the conscience and guarded by peace. This ideal of America is the hope of all mankind. Uh, and a good old hymn that I remember singing. Uh, there's power, wonder-working power, in the goodness and idealism and faith of the American people. America is a nation with a mission, and that mission comes from our most basic beliefs. This great republic will lead the cause of freedom. And so what's interesting, I won't belabor these other quotes, why does he say these things? Uh, most people, again, the Jesus factor, it's because he's an evangelical Christian who somehow uh, connected religious language to the United States of America. Uh, in fact, uh, he stands in the tradition of presidents going all the way back, and probably the greatest is Abraham Lincoln, uh, of invoking uh, the divine uh, uh, status of America, or the quasi-divine status. And so it might not be bad theology because he's a Christian. What, what's going on here is not the fact that he's a Christian. Perhaps the real root of this is that he's the president of the United States. Uh, and so when people talk about the absolute claims being made here, it's not because he's a Christian who didn't set aside his Christianity enough. It's because as president, you have to assume those, what I would say, absolute, fairly divisive, and perhaps insufficiently rational things to say. Um, so our call is to demythologize, refuse to engage in polemics against religion as a peculiar cause of violence. Um, I think we need to discipline ourselves. And so I don't know, because I'm not... I don't, I wouldn't say that I work within the discipline of religious studies. And so this is what's interesting to me as we think though about exploring that arena. In some way, part of that arena's job is to make itself unnatural. 
right? Or to make itself, right, to deconstruct what's what's going on there. Um, and co-belligerence, because I still want to fight somebody. Um, I, I think that it's worth uh, trying to actually re-enchant secular nationalism, to, to pull back uh, and say, what is actually going on here? Uh, and a number of different authors have, uh, have, have already done this quite well. Um, but say there's something very powerful going on in the rites, uh, the liturgies of the nation uh, that inculcate this kind of uh, absolute devotion uh, that leads to uh, the kind of unquestioning uh, obedience that uh, others are worried that religious people might have. Uh, and so I think those are three suggestions uh, that I have for, for going forward. And I'll stop there. Thanks.